and um, I was asked to do a talk on artificial intelligence to artists. So that's that's how far how far it's gone. So as Kedis alluded, um, I'm actually originally a software engineer. And I was very much the engineer, not really interested in people. You know, it was about machines and building software systems. And then I became fascinated by psychology later on in my life. And I wanted to move completely away from computers and machines to study psychology, mostly because I was curious about who I am um, and what makes me tick. Um, and then decided not to go the psychology route because you work with, with pathology and discovered this amazing field called coaching. And that's about 15 years ago when it was just on the app and realized that, you know, we could we can help people to become a better version of themselves using principles of psychology. And I was taken to it immediately. And then I studied, uh, eventually did a PhD in, in, in coaching and then discovered my passion for research. So now I have these worlds where I understand software and engineering, but I wanted nothing to do with that. I wanted to help people. That was my main calling. Um, but then also realizing that coaching is not really available to everyone, right? It's very expensive. Um, as you will know, I believe there are people from the um, United States and other parts of the world. $300 for an hour of coaching is not uncommon. South Africa, we, we're a bit cheaper, but it's still out of reach for most people. And then the idea was planted about five years ago. Is there a way to use technology to help to democratize and scale coaching to make it available to more people? And that's what set in motion a series of events, which I'll tell you about later. But basically, it's about how do we scale and democratize coaching by using technology and helping as many people as possible. Fabulous, Nikki. What an interesting journey that you've been on and, yeah, traversed to get to this place. And, and so if you were to give us a little bit of like an updated context for where we are in terms of AI and coaching, so that we can set the scene a little bit. What what else would you add at this point before we we check in with the audience and see where we all are? Yes, yeah, so, uh, so I don't want to give away too much now because I want to see the results of the poll first. But what I can tell you is that typically when we think of, well, let me quickly share my screen. There's just two slides quickly as an intro um, that I think would, would position this nicely. Um, so just two slides. The first one is to say that AI is not new, right? We've been fascinated by the idea of machines that can do things that humans can do for many years. So back in 1770, there was this machine called uh, Mechanical Turk, M Turk, Mechanical Turk. It was a mannequin that was dressed like a Turkish um, gentleman here and he could play chess and it would move a stick and show you how to move, you know, play against you. It, apparently, it was taken all over the world. It beat Napoleon Bonaparte. It beat Benjamin Franklin. But what it really was, there was a human sitting underneath you, pulling all sorts of levers, um, so mimicking the idea of a, a machine playing chess. So hmm. it's not new. We're fascinated by the idea. But now, more recently, you might see, you might know Sophia, a humanoid a robot. She's even been to South Africa. Quite amazing to see her in action, right? So it looks like a real human. It's got uh, the skin almost looks human-like. It can talk. It can move. Um, she might replace receptionists at hotels and other uh, service points. Then there's a company called Boston Dynamics. If you haven't seen their products, it's incredible. Go to YouTube after this session and um, type in Boston Dynamics. They create robots that really move like humans, um, you know, uh, they can navigate obstacles, they can figure out paths and solutions for themselves. The next thing, I can just imagine this thing holding a gun and you have a robot soldier. And what we see in the public domain is a fraction of what's already uh, available in terms of technology. So I'm sure they're working on things like this, not them specifically, but the technology is there. And then of course, the biggest upset and biggest curveball and excitement, depending what angle you take, is ChatGPT. So I normally ask my audience uh, in a live audience who has who has used ChatGPT, who has not used ChatGPT, and um, I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, have tried ChatGPT, and it really um, promises to cause a lot of upset and uh, challenging the way we do things. So as a as an intro before we do the poll, I think you know the robots aren't coming; they are here. They are amongst us. They are doing their stuff, and the question is. What, how is this going to affect 
coaching? You know, will we have a humanoid coach that looks like a human that can coach? Um, ChatGPT is already used for coaching. It is here. And the question is, are we ready as coaches? And I think with that, I'll let you run the poll. Thank you. Julia, will you launch it for us? So this is just a poll to get a sense of where we all are before we we hear where, yeah, Nikki's sort of download in it in more depth. Uh, we want to just get a sense of where we are. So if you can, you've got one choice. So choose how you're feeling about AI and its impact on coaching currently. Okay, so that looks like it. So, Julia, do you want to end the poll? So we've got the... So isn't that great that we are sitting mostly with curiosities? The last time I was in a room when this was done, there was a lot more sitting at the bottom end of the poll. Um, yeah. Key, how does this compare to... I know it's slightly different to your poll, but well, how does this no, compare to what we normally see? I definitely agree with you. So I've been doing this kind of polls for a, for a number of years now. And in the beginning, um, the curve was definitely more towards the ambivalent, fearful, skeptical side. Um, normally, after my talk, it, it moves to the other side a little bit more. But it's great to be curious, right? I think this is the only thing that's going to, uh, it's a key ingredient for getting us through this. So I mm. think it's, it's, a, it's a, I think as coaches, we are curious by nature, right? So I guess that explains it. Um, mm. Mm. And also, okay. interesting, different parts of the world have different results uh, when I ask this. I find that um, in, 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 when I do this in the United States, people are generally more positive and open to this, whereas in other parts of the world, people are a bit more uh, uh, reluctant or skeptical. Uh, this is something I've picked up over the, over the, over the time. Mm. Thanks, Nikki. Anybody else wanting to comment on what we're seeing there in the poll? Anything else standing out for anybody needs to be named? I just had one thought, and that was, uh, depending on what our Enneagrams are, might affect our response. So I'm a seven, so I'm more positive, but somebody who's a six may be more skeptical. Yes, absolutely. So we may well see a correlation with Enneagram. Mm. And possibly even maturity, actually, wouldn't we, Julia? We might see a difference. Yeah, we might. <clears throat> or we might not, because maybe... Um... Maybe um, at later levels, the humanizing aspect of coaching might be viewed as more important than the content provision, but who knows? Mm. Mm. Cool. It's actually great to be speaking to, 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 to people familiar with Enneagram. I was just saying in the intro um, to Katie and Julia that I'm also a great fan of Enneagram, so we can mm. definitely bring that into discussion at some point. It's making me think, Nikki, I want to ask you, like, which type do you lead from? <laughs> but Definitely can... type five. All good Definitely researchers are type five. Great. <laughs> Great. I must say, when I saw that range of study, I was like, I wonder how far, yeah, whether this is a five energy. So thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with that, shall we shall we launch in, Nikki? Yes, let's let's do it. Um and we've got plenty of time, so if you if you want to interrupt me or, during and ask questions, I'm I'm really I'm open to that. Yeah. Um, curious, and so, me... so maybe so maybe just to set the scene. So we are going to do a little bit of a deep dive. Nikki's got some slides to share and lots to talk through, and then we will open up for questions and later on in the session move into a breakout to make more sense of what we've heard. But we want to make good use of our time with Nikki, so we're going to start off with a little bit more of a a dive in. Thanks, Nikki. Right. Uh, I'm just curious. Curious. Can you can you type in the chat box just wh where you are currently? Um, uh, I just want to get a sense of South Africa, if it's overseas. Um, goodness me. Okay, we're already quickly spanning the globe here. <laughs> okay, nice to see so many South Africans as well. Like I said, I normally do this talk overseas. And uh, okay, I, I get a good sense of this. So. That's lovely. Great. Thanks for that. So so let me let me take you through a quick whirlwind of, of what I've been playing around with um, 
the last few years. So I want to share with you four things today. What is artificial intelligence? Because I think we often don't really know, we call things artificial intelligence that isn't AI, and it helps to understand it, to know what it's capable of. How can it be used in coaching? Obviously something we're all very interested in. Then what evidence do we have for AI? And finally, my insights and recommendations. You know, when I became a coach in 2009, I was actually quite shocked at how easy it is to call yourself a coach. Um, it was a bit the same in the IT industry. I did a master's degree in electronic engineering, and then I worked in a company where anyone can call themselves a software engineer with, without the same qualification. And to this day, it's still uh, still something that, that is quite uh, close to me, to my heart, is the fact that, you know, without evidence for what we practice, how can we claim what we do in coaching? 10, 15 years ago, it was, it was even worse, where people would claim efficacy and they would claim return on investment of 500%. 10,000% without any scientific rigor in how they measure it. So I set out in my human coaching, and you'll, you'll see I, I use the word human coaching quite often in my talk, which is something, I think a concept that didn't exist a few years ago. A coach was a coach, right? Now you have to distinguish between a human coach and a, an AI coach. So in, in human coaching, I've published a number of studies on what is coaching, how does it work, when does it work? And when I decided to study artificial intelligence coaching, I made a point of wanting to study the evidence for it, to understand what we know, what we can claim and what we can't claim. And that's why I'll show you some of the research I've done. AI, generally, uh, definition, it's a collection of technologies um, that help mimic cognitive human function. So it's trying to uh, mimic human intelligence. That, in, in essence, is what AI is. So. There's many applications of AI, there's computer vision, there is natural language processing, virtual assistants like we've seen with Siri, there's Boston Dynamics with robotics. And then recently there's something called large language models, ChatGPT. And if you're anywhere into art, um, I just want to see this quickly in the chat. Just also uh, please uh, type there if you if you have tried ChatGPT, just type yes if you have tried ChatGPT, type no if you you haven't tried ChatGPT. Okay, so most people have, have used it. If you haven't, um, you you really should. Um, oh, there are quite a few people who haven't used it. That's the other thing I want to also just mention, since there is such a large South African audience. Um, I, I find that I did this talk at the, at the HR conference in Johannesburg recently. And we must be careful in South Africa because when I ask this question overseas, almost everyone has, has at least tried it. So I think AI has the ability for us to leapfrog many of the disadvantages we have as a developing country, but we have to be on top of it. So after this session, it's for free. Just sign up and use ChatGPT. Watch a few YouTube videos to see how it works. Um, it, it really is revolutionary. And then DALI is a software product that can make you, that, we, that you used to generate art Literally, you type a line, for example, in Joburg last week, I typed the line, generate a landscape painting of Johannesburg with the SABC tower at sunset. And within five seconds, it generated an oil, oil painting. So generative AI, I think why I'm using this example here, before now, artificial intelligence was things that you could train to recognize other, other things. You could, you could train it to recognize a bicycle or a handbag or a person. Um, you could train it to pick up boxes and do stuff. You could train it to recognize your language. But ChatGPT and DALI is an example of what's called a large language model or generative AI. And these generative AI tools is a new class of AI technology that is able to generate content. So it's not, not only able to recognize patterns, it can generate new content. And this is what people are so concerned about and excited about at the same time. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about that later. But it's important to distinguish between different types of artificial intelligence. That's what's called artificial narrow intelligence, artificial general intelligence, and super intelligence. And artificial general intelligence is a machine that can do something really well, probably better than a human. A self-driving car, for example, or um, with radiology, you know, AI has now been trained to be more accurate than a radiologist in detecting lung defects but it can do that thing really well. It can't make you a cup of tea or talk to you about where you should go on holiday. 
So artificial general and super intelligence is AI that's as good or better than a human. And this does not exist at the moment. And the experts agree that in our lifetime, we will not see, unless there's a breakthrough, we will not see artificial general and super intelligence. This is important because I think it helps us to calm down a little bit. Yes, AI can be very good in a specific area. My research shows that, but it's not yet at the point where it will completely replace a human. It can help us to become more efficient. It can augment us, but it won't replace us. And I think this is what we have to keep in mind when we talk about AI. AI is a new, started in the late 1940s. It's had two winters. So two areas during these periods where attention or interest in it dropped completely because it was hyped. It was oversold by people who wanted investment. And I think we were on a trajectory for that to happen again because self-driving cars were supposed to be part of our lives a long time ago, right? It's still not happening. I know parts of America, they have trials now. I think in, in San Francisco, you the Ubers that drive around, but it's, it's not, it hasn't gone as far as we, as we thought it was. But I think the use of this, the, the explosion of generative AI late last year through ChatGPT has put us on a trajectory for a very long, a prolonged uh, period of, of popularity and usage. Uh, let's skip this. And I'm going to just now move on to, so now that we know what AI, artificial intelligence is at a high level, it's basically machines that are trained on vast amounts of data, literally millions and millions of, well, the more data, the better. In the past, it was to recognize certain things, patterns, images, words, sentences, um, and to predict things maybe even, but it couldn't generate anything. And now with large language models, ChatGPT, it can generate content. It does that because it's been trained to understand that if you give it, for example, a sentence, the sentence could be, um, the man is talking about, the man is sitting in front of his computer. Because it's been trained on, on millions of examples, it knows statistically what is the most likely sentence to precede that sentence and what's the most likely sentence to follow that sentence. And based on that principle, having seen millions of examples, it can now generate content. It can write a story about a man behind a computer and you can tell it to do in the style of Shakespeare. And because it's been trained on Shakespeare data, it can generate Shakespeare-like content. And you can even ask it to coach you. And if you give it the right prompting, it makes some very bad attempt at coaching you, but it can generate content. As an example, um, a while ago, uh, researchers at a uh, university, I forget the detail now, I think it might have been Stanford, trained an AI about how to go about when you go to a movie, all right? So the question is, what do you do when you go to a movie? So it gave it thousands of examples of people going to the movie, stories about people going to the movies. And it would say, you know, typically buy a ticket, get someone to go to the movie. And it gave it lots of different examples. When it asked the AI, tell us now, what do you do when you go to the movie? The AI said the following. It said, first of all, I will find someone to go with me to the movies. Then I will buy a ticket. Then we will meet up. We'll go to the movie. We'll buy, we'll buy a ticket. Um, we go inside. And then I held the person's hand and kiss her, right? Because that is the data it was trained on. And this is something we'll talk about later, bias in data. AI is just as good as what it's been trained on. And all the inherent biases that we have as humans that's present in the data it's trained on comes through. And this is a danger for us when we use AI for coaching, but I'm running ahead of myself. Right, how can it be used for coaching? So I draw this diagram to distinguish. There's a coach, there's a client traditional humans. I think AI can be used to substitute human coaches. So to completely replace human coaches in certain aspects of coaching. Now, this is quite controversial. And when I tell my coaching students this, they get a bit annoyed with me because they say, we've just paid a lot of money to be, to be trained as coaches. Now you're saying you're going to replace us. But my counter argument to this is that, as I said before, many people will never be able to experience human coaching so if we can create AI coaches, they won't be as good as a human coach, but they can do a specific aspect of human coaching. For example, goal attainment, if they can do that really well, or maybe Enneagram debriefing. I haven't even thought about that, right? If they can do that really well, then maybe we give some of that benefit to people. Another aspect is to support coach and client before, during, and after coaching. So before a coaching session, we all, a lot of us do onboarding, 
um, basic questions, asking certain things about goals. The AI could perhaps help with that. During the coaching, what happens in between coaching session? I see my clients every two to three weeks. A lot of time passes in between. What if you have an AI coaching chatbot, for example, that can check in with a client in between sessions to keep the momentum going and then send a report to the coach before the next session to say, well, this is what I spoke about to the client. This is what the client was thinking about. Maybe you can take that further in your session. What happens after coaching? So typically I get given six sessions, maybe eight, if I'm lucky, 10, because uh, corporates don't want to pay that much. Maybe it takes three to six months. What happens after the coaching? Imagine you have an AI chatbot coach that can prolong the effect of coaching by helping the person to keep reflecting, reflective practice, experiential learning, um, goal setting, those kind of things. So these are the three aspects, I think, where there's a lot of potential and that can make us as human coaches better. This is where we can collaborate with AI to become better coaches. Then there's AI that can help the coach. It can help to train and make a coach better. Now, what do I mean by this? So um, there's a company I'm currently working with, Ovida.org. I'll, I'll show you um, uh, the details just now. They have developed this product where when you want to train as a coach or update your skills, you, you do a coaching session, like on Zoom. It records the session. It then uses artificial intelligence to analyze that session. And it calculates a number of metrics. For example, the talk time. You know, a coach is supposed to talk less than a client, typically. It can calculate the number of open-ended questions. It can calculate the interruption rate. It can look at head movement and aha moments. And it can track your progress over a number of sessions and it can show you graphs. It can even summarize the session for you in two paragraphs, what the entire hour conversation was long, which I find very useful. I make, I scribble, you know, I make, I've got a very bad handwriting, so I scribble notes when I coach people. Now the AI can just summarize it for me in two paragraphs. So for my next session, I know what's, what's coming up. And incredibly, they're working on a feature where, um, I don't know how many of you are ICF accredited, but uh, you know, uh, we're all uh, supposed to be, or we should be a part of a coaching body. They've trained the AI to, in a coaching conversation, extract ICF competencies. So let's say the one ICF competency is uh, questioning, right? There must be this one on questioning and listening, if I remember correctly. It can literally go through your entire coaching conversation and extract examples. It'll rate you out of 10 for how well you did each of the 11 ICF competencies. I think there's 11. And then show you examples in your transcript of where you demonstrated that. How incredible is that for new coaches, right? Or even existing coaches to be able to do that. So that's an example of AI making better coaches of us. And then I think a fourth application is the analysis of data. So if data is recorded during a coaching session, you could maybe get an AI to spot patterns. Um, you know, I've coached almost 2,000 hours now over the, over the years. And what if I could give that data to an AI and ask it to look for patterns in my coaching, the way I question people, the way I come across, um, the, you know, and, and maybe the type of clients I have, the type of goals. AI is really good at pattern recognition, much better than humans. And I think that's a, um, what, what we can rely on AI for. So, so Ovida.org, have a look at them if, if you don't know about them. I'm helping them with their research currently, a, a very dynamic uh, startup company. They've built this platform to help coaching. Oh, and, and by the way, in Stellenbosch University, where we train masters uh, in philosophy of coaching students, we've given them, we give them access to this platform. So they get 12 sessions where as well as human supervisors, they can coach on the platform and the platform will give them feedback. And we found the students love it because now uh, without being judged and without um, having to spend and pay for the time of a human, they get this kind of feedback. And personally, my research is focused around creating chatbot coaches that can substitute human coaches for the reason I've mentioned and to create AI chatbot coaches that can help support the human coaching process. And um, the company I have, um, so the little story about that, I did a research three, four years ago on coaching, AI coaching efficacy, really very naively in the sense, not knowing what's going to happen. I, I attended a conference somewhere where someone spoke about AI and coaching. And I got a bit annoyed because the person clearly didn't know what AI was about. And from an engineering perspective, some of the things weren't accurate. And I thought, well, because I'm an engineer, let me go and build an AI chatbot coach and actually research it and see if it's any good. 
and I was skeptical. I thought best year could be one or two papers I publish, which as an academic is, you know, it's what we have to do. And I was pleasantly surprised, I'll show you later, at the stunning results we got from the efficacy of this very simple AI chatbot coach. It's even before ChatGPT was available with generative text. It was a very scripted, structured chatbot coach. And then we established this company, coachvici.com, which is half owned or partly owned by Stellenbosch University and partly owned by me. And we are now in the process of commercializing this. We, we're actually rolling it out to customers where we democratize coaching by giving this chatbot to the people in the organization who wouldn't normally have access to it. But more importantly, my research is focused around these areas. So I have a number of masters and PhD students, and we, we look at this from all different angles and try and see you know, what works, what doesn't work, and what should we be aware of. So I want to not kill you with lots of detail. Um, I want to maybe quickly touch on some of the research I've done. These are the studies that I've published so far. Um, there's two more in review. I did a study on how to design AI coaches. So how do you go about to create AI coaches? Then we looked at what factors will play a role in whether people use this AI coach or not. Because it's one thing to create technology, but if they're not going to use it, what's the point? Then we did one on goal attainment specifically. I created a chatbot coach called Coach Vici, and we tested it over a year-long period in a randomized control, longitudinal trial, to see how well it works. Sorry. Then we compared it to human coaching. So we had two studies for over two years. The one was a study for a year that used humans. The other study used the AI coach, and we found surprisingly positive results. And then also recently, I, we gave it to students to use, um, and we tested their perceptions. And there's two more studies where I um, we looked at the effect of voice versus text. So if you talk to a chatbot, do people prefer to talk to it, or do they want to type text? We also had a study that's currently under review where we asked coaches, but maybe I'm running ahead of myself here. Um, yeah. We ask coaches, here's a chatbot coach, right? It can help you in between your human coaching sessions. We demonstrated the chatbot and we asked them, what do you think of this? It was a qualitative study, so we interviewed them. Then we took the same chatbot and we actually used it with coaching clients over four sessions and we interviewed them. And what was interesting to me is that generally the coaches were quite skeptical of this chatbot. They thought it will interfere with the relationship. It will interfere with the working alliance, which is a measure we use for measuring the, um, the bond and the goal and task efficacy between coach and client. They said, yeah, it might be useful, but I'm not sure my clients will want to use it. The clients, on the other hand, were very positive about this. They really enjoyed it. They thought it would be useful as long as the coach endorsed it. So now we have this conundrum and this potential paradox where coaches feel threatened by AI. Clients think it's very useful but they need the coach to endorse it. And this is kind of the, the funny situation we sit in, which I believe as coaches, we need to make a mind shift to realize that this is not a threat to us, that it can really enhance our ability. And we have to embrace this, understand how it works and help our clients to, to embrace it as well. If of course we, we comply with the ethical aspects, which I'll talk about later, it's not just plain sailing. There are a few things we have to be wary about. Briefly, some of my research, the Designing AI Coaching Framework, a study I published on how to create AI coaches. What I postulate here is that let's look at what's effective in human coaching. Then let's look at what is best practices for building chatbot coaches. Let's combine the two. And that should help us create good AI coaches, right? So don't worry about all the details here. But what I basically say is if you build an AI chatbot coach, have a specific outcome in mind, goal attainment or... Uh, uh, character, uh, um, uh, emotional intelligence or resilience. Have a specific thing in mind because we've got narrow AI at this stage. You've got to focus the AI. It can't do lots of things. Then pick a theoretical model that's specific to the coaching outcome. So Anthony Grant from Sydney, Australia, for example, created, um, he used goal theory and created it in a coaching context. So I use that for coach reaching. Then there's things like trust, empathy, transparency, predictability, all these things. As good coaches, this is these are the things that we have to do. This is not my word. I found this through a literature search. And then I 
looked at what does it mean? What does trust mean for a chatbot? What does empathy mean for a chatbot? What does transparency mean for AI and predictability? And I found sources to give us guidelines on what we can do. For example, there's something called the uncanny valley effect. So when I ask you, and you can do the chatbots quickly now, which, which image left or right makes you feel more uncomfortable? Which makes you feel more uncomfortable, the, the one on the left or the one on the right? You can just type left or right. That makes you more uncomfortable. Yeah, that's what most people most people say on the right. So what's happening here? Because this looks like a human, right? We should be more comfortable with it. It's something called the uncanny valley effect. This means that if I if I hold up an uh, object that has no resemblance to a human, like this pen, for example, um, it's emotional. Its res resemblance to its human likeness is zero. So you've got a, you have a neutral emotional reaction. If I start drawing two eyes and a smiley face on this pen, you might start having a positive positive reaction because it's starting to feel more human like. But at somewhere, some place here, if it looks too close to a human, we drop into this valley of negative emotional reaction, which is called the uncanny valley. And that is um, where it starts reminding us of a dead body, a cadaver, maybe. You know, it's got an eerie, weird feeling. Um, and this is what some of the things we have to take in mind into consideration when you design an AI code. So avoid the uncanny valley effect. So when I create AI chatbot coaches, for example, be careful to make it look like a human. Be careful. You've got to have some of it. You've got to give it a name, preferably a gender neutral name, for example. It's got to show empathy, but not too much. So there's a fine balance between, uh, you know, what you, uh, how human like it should be and how not. These are all the design considerations. And this is what I built into my first paper that I published. It's a conceptual paper and it's been cited quite a few times because I think people find it useful to understand how to create AI coaches. The next study was technology adoption. What will people, why will people use the chatbot? We use something called the Unified Theory of um, Acceptance and Use of Technology. It's a standard instrument we use, structural equation modeling for anyone who's, who's a nerd in the audience. Um, and we tested what will people um, value most, how useful the chatbot is, how easy it is to use, what other people think of them using it, what infrastructure they require, or what the risks are. And what we found is that people rated these three options the highest. They will use the chatbot if it's useful. It's obvious, I know, but we have empirical evidence for this now. So the chatbot must be able to do what it says. It can't promise and not deliver, otherwise they'll stop using it. Ease of use was not an issue. Strangely enough, they valued others' opinions. So again, and this comes through in the qualitative study I did, where if the coach says it's okay to use this chatbot, people will use it. It's almost because it's so new, they have to get endorsement from people that they trust. And when we roll this out in organizations now, we make sure that there's a champion or you know someone who uh, influencer in a sense who believes in this genuinely and who's used it and can spread the word. And then you have to have a right infrastructure. So we use um, Coach Vici on on mobile phone. Initially, we thought of creating a special app for it, and then we realized that it's just another app. You know, statistics show that people use maybe four or five apps max on their phone. You've got hundreds downloaded, but you only use five. So we decided to embed it in the current. Mm -hmm. um, uh, instant messaging platforms like WhatsApp. WhatsApp is big in South Africa. It's not that big in America. I think it's about 75 million users. But we can also embed it in things like MS Teams and Slack. Um, so to make it part of your everyday usage. So that's what we found through this study. So bottom line is when you when you create an AI coach, make sure it works, get buy-in and consider the technology platform. Um, yeah, so this is interesting. So we used voice versus text. Um, I think I mentioned it briefly. Do people prefer to talk to a chatbot or do they want to type? That's something I was curious about. So we launched a study. We did a, a study with, uh, I think, over 400 respondents where we had them talk to two different types of coaching chatbots. We also measured introvert, extroverts. And what we found is that introverts, introverts prefer to talk, not to text. That was our hypothesis was the other way around. We expected introverts to want to type. It was a surprise. And when we had to explain it, we, we, we realized that it also ties to another study I've done where people claim that they feel psychologically safer with a chatbot than with a human coach. Can you believe that, right? It was a shock to me as a coach. People state that they felt psychologically safer with a chatbot coach than with a human coach because they don't feel judged. 
And I know as coaches, we we believe that we are so amazing, and we are, and we we keep all our biases behind us. But you know, I you might remind me of my mother or my sister or someone I just had a fight with in the office yesterday. Even though you're a very innocent, uh, benign, helping coach, those emotional responses and triggers are tip, uh, normal for humans. With a chatbot, you don't have that. It's a it's a neutral response. Now, I'm not saying that a chatbot can have the same empathy and emotional connection, but it's perceived as not being judgmental. That counters for something. So maybe that's why introverts preferred it. We also found that people like the voice to initially establish rapport because they could talk to the chatbot that could explain who it is. But for complex tasks like typing, what is your goal? How have you progressed with your goal? They prefer to type because they could have time to think. They could backspace. They could make, you know, change their mistakes. They've typed so. Our recommendation in this paper was hook them with voice and then for complex tasks, use, use text. Then we, um, yeah, I mentioned this, the perceptions of AI chatbot coaching assistance where the coaches felt it might interfere, but the clients felt psychologically safe. I've, I've covered that. And then uh, recently we started trying this out in corporates. The studies before was with students. So first time graduate employees, people that have just finished studying, they go and work, in corporates, they're typically under, uh, what's the word, supported, I think, because it's expensive, right? You can't give them an executive coach, not at $300 an hour. So we gave them our, my, our chatbot coach, Coach Vici. They used it for two months, and then we interviewed them. They liked the fact that it was available, friendly, action-oriented, um, keeping them accountable. They missed the personal human touch. But here are some of the quotes that I found quite interesting. It's a qualitative study, once again. So remember, these are now 20, early 20-year-old 20 uh, South African uh, employees. One day I went to the hair salon during the weekend, and I was like, whatever, like, okay, let me talk to her now. So I love that flexibility. So here was this graduate employee sitting at the hair salon talking to Coach Vici about her, her working goals. And she also said, which I don't have in here, uh, the chatbot was more available than my mentor. I have a mentor at work, but I can never get an appointment with him, right? Always on, always available, 24-7, non-judgmental. This quote from participant nine, really from a theoretical level and adult learning is quite significant. It said, using the chatbot made me think about how I do things, how I think about my goals and what I need to change. Now, if you're into adult learning and especially transformative learning, this points to second order learning or double loop learning, right? It points to the fact that not only if they was they able, were they able to set goals, they were becoming aware of how they think about their thinking. And this is the kind of outcome we want as human coaches. If I get this with my clients, I'm very happy because I've helped them to become aware on a deeper level of who they are. This chatbot was able to do this. And then still uh, chewing on this one, I think it's because it implements goal theory so precisely. That's what a chatbot does, right? So because of the way it asks questions about goal setting, um, this person became aware of the errors in their thinking of how to set goals. By the way, uh, one of my students is, is working on creating a chatbot for, for Gen Z, so the young generation, um, uh, to help them with emotional intelligence. And our, the li literature review was quite interesting we've done so far. It shows that Gen Z is the generation with the biggest discrepancy between their perception of how good they are at goal setting and how good they really are at goal setting. Never in the history has there been such a discrepancy. So they don't know what they don't know. They think they're fantastic at setting goals. And their managers tell us they're actually quite crap at it. They, they don't know how to do it. So, uh, and this is where I think something like this who, who appeals to this, uh, appeals to this um, generation could also be useful. And then just to say that it's not, it's not all positive, um, you know, I, I would have enjoyed it more if it was personalized and made it less robotic, making it more personal to make me feel like I'm not speaking to a robot. But I must say, this study was done before ChatGPT, right? So we had Coach Vici, which was this, there's two types of chatbots, roughly speaking. There's a rule-based, um, deterministic chatbot, I guess you could call it, where it has a number, if, 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 if the chatbot asks you, how are you doing today? And you say, it's going great. In the background, it has maybe a number of options pre-programmed. If great, then say, well done, or say, glad to hear it, it's fixed, right? Um, with ChatGPT, which we have integrated into the latest version of Coach Vici, it can generate content. It can generate its own conversation based on some strict parameters we give it. And it sounds incredibly 
human-like. I mean, I play with it all the time. Um, and it, it's remarkable how um, human-like it sounds because it's been trained on millions and millions of examples of human conversation. So I think this comment, if I had to repeat the study, I probably wouldn't get something like this now because it's very, um, it's, it's more uh, human-like. In fact, the latest study that I've just run the, the, the experiment and we're waiting for the stats, we created two chatbots. One used the GROW model, you know, the good old GROW model, goal, reality, options, rap or will. And it was a scripted one where it would ask you a question, what is your goal? You would say, I want to have a better work-life balance. And it would say, the chatbot would reply, that's a great goal to have. Let's think about it some more. But it wouldn't be specific about what you've just said. It didn't know that you said work-life balance or, you know, it was just uh, pre-programmed responses. Then I created the generative version of the GROW model that uses ChatGPT integrated. And if you would say, you know, I want to have a better work-life balance, it could say something like, um, it's great that you value your work-life balance. Um, you know, it, it really has been shown to help people in the long run with their health. So now suddenly it knows what you're talking about. It can generate a response based on what you've said. And it sounds far more human-like. Um, and I, we've run, run the experiment and the initial stats show that people have a far more positive uh, you know, response to the generative bot. So that's a paper in the making. Yeah, that was the chat GPT so. Okay, now two more studies I want to share. This is this is really exciting. So we I then asked the so knowing how to build a chatbot and knowing which technology factors influence its uptake, we then said, does it work? Does this chatbot work? And we did the following study. It was over 10 months. It was a randomized control trial, which means you take two groups of participants. The one group gets the intervention. So we gave them Coach Vichy, the chatbot to use over 10 months. The other group um, received reading material. So you have to give a placebo. They weren't coached, but they received information about goal attainment. So we measured the stress, wellness, goal attainment, and resilience of both groups. Um, these are the sample sizes, 75 and 94. What we found is after 10 months, the chatbot was not able to reduce their stress, increase their wellness, or change their resilience, but it was able to help with goal attainment. So we were not surprised that stress, wellness, and resilience was not improved because the chatbot wasn't created for that. The algorithms we used and the theories we used were specifically goal oriented. Remember what I said, it's because narrow artificial intelligence has to have a specific focus. But for goal attainment that we did program it for, we saw the following results. Look at this graph, where initially we asked people, what is your level of, we asked them to pick two goals. And then we asked them, how complete is your goal? And what's the complexity of your goal? And you can see, as you would expect for both groups, it's pretty much the same. It's in the mid uh, high 20s. Then a month later, we measured it again, a month later, a month later. And you can see that the, the black line here are people using Coach Vici. So they're talking to it, as much as they want, um, because it's it's for free and it's, it's it's scalable. So what's interesting, what happens initially, when you ask someone what's your goal and you just leave them be, this is the gray line, for the first month, second month, th for the first three months, if you keep asking them how's it going with the goal, they make progress, right? They report that the goal is actually improving, they're reaching their goal. But because there's no support, it seems like after three months, it starts tapering off and they basically fizzle out. Think of New Year's resolutions, right? 1st of January, we're going to all lose weight, go to the gym, eat less, those things. And then three months later, it doesn't happen. What happened with Coach Vici, after the first month, the level of reported goal attainment actually decreased. So people using the chatbot had a lower self-report score on goal attainment. And why is this? It, I think it is because when you're faced with a reality, remember the chatbot will ask you questions about your goal. How realistic is this goal? How important is this goal? How much time do you think you have to spend on it? And it'll check in with you on a weekly basis by sending you a pop-up reminder to ask you coaching questions. How's it going with the goal? And maybe after the first month, you realize, damn, this goal isn't going to be as easy as I thought. You know, I've got to put some work in. So it decreases initially, but then with the continued support of the chatbot and asking you the questions and nudging you along. If you've done well, it'll say, fantastic. It's so amazing that you've done well. Keep going. Now let's see what you can do next. What action do you want to set next? Eventually, it had double the rate of goal attainment. So after 10 months, because there's a three month gap here, the chatbot had double the rate of goal attainment compared to the, to the control group. And this is what launched our commercial company. Because I realized if this is what's possible, then the world needs to get this chatbot, right? Because it can help people with goal attainment. 
But then we also did the second study. So we were very lucky in that the year before I did the chat, the year before we did this study, another group of researchers um, in the same cohort of students did a study between human coaches and a control group. So 100 students received human coaching over a period of six months, one session per month, because again, that's all there was money for, because human coaching is expensive, plus a three-month wait period at the end. And we measured these stress, wellness, goal attainment over 10 months and a control group. So fortunately, as we would expect, the people that had, people that had human coaching, they improved in all four of these aspects. So their stress was lower, their resilience was higher, their wellness was better, and the goal attainment was higher. But then we thought, let's take only goal attainment, in which the chatbot was um, showed efficacy and compare it to humans, to the human coaching group. And this is what we found. We actually found that compared to human coaching, human coaching people are the top line. They also do this dip in the beginning. And this is how their goal attainment increased. The dotted line below is the AI chatbot coach. And you can see how it slightly less than the human coach, but not by much. And then right at the end, it catches up with the human coaching because the human coaching stopped here after six months, because it ran out of money, but people could continue using the chatbot coach. And in fact, we, we controlled for frequency of use and the more people that use the chatbot, the higher the uh, goal attainment they had. And these are the control groups. So then we realized, oh my goodness, we're sitting on something here where for something very specific, if you have an AI coach, it can be as effective as a human coach. And the rest is now history, as they say. So this is the first uh, in the world efficacy study, randomized control trial that compared AI coaching with human coaching that showed positive results. And I pointed out these two aspects. All right, so let's wrap up uh, for now. So after four years of research, it's actually five years now, what are my insights? I really believe AI coaching could democratize and scale coaching. It could make coaching available to many more people out there that could never have human coaching. We did a study, for example, with unemployed youths in South Africa. So if you're South African, you will know our crisis in unemployment, um, over 30% for the entire population. And youth unemployment, that's people um, younger than 35 years, between 18 and 35, is 55% unemployment. It's, it's one of the worst in the world. So we did a study where we gave them Coach Vici, um, over a period, unfortunately, the study wasn't long enough because it was a master's student. We only had two months versus a control group. And we, we started seeing a trend in goal attainment for the unemployed youth, but the study wasn't long enough. We'll have to repeat that. But imagine if you give a chatbot to people who don't have employment and it can help them. I looked at the goals, for example. Some of the goals was how do I save money to get a driver's license? How do I... Um, make sure that I get into a uh, college or university. And if the chatbot gets in with them, helps them by nudging them, helping them think of actions, we could maybe address something like youth unemployment. Even in organizations, not everyone has access to a coach. So um, it's about scaling coaching, giving it a, uh, accessibility to, to everyone in the organization. Don't fear as human coaches, because I think it will expand, it will expand the need for human coach. Maybe some, maybe people's first contact with coaching will be an AI coach. And then they feel, wow, this is great, but I now need to speak to a human to get the next level coaching. So we draw more people into the coaching uh, uh, paradigm and they will ask for human coaching. You could also, for example, in an organization, see who engages with a coaching chatbot more frequently. Who are, you know, readiness for coaching is one of the main predictors of coaching success. If your client isn't ready, it won't work. So if they engage with a chatbot, maybe that's an indication of how ready they are for human coaching. And you can optimize and maximize your, your human coaching. I'm thinking now in your paradigm with Enneagram and the assessments that you do, you know, what if you use a chatbot such as this to, to administer the, uh, the coaching, uh, the Enneagram or the chatbot? We develop chatbots for an American company that will read from their database results from assessments and goal setting. And the chatbot can then intelligently talk to you about it. So if it's a type five, it could start asking you questions and give you some basic information about that. Not to take away from the human coach, but and actually an idea I've had for, for Enneagram specifically, um, you know, if, if you create an AI coach and it's aware of your personality type, your Enneagram type, it could it could customize some of the questions it's asking based on, 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 on who you are. That's what I do in my coaching uh, specifically in between the coaching sessions. So it can be a very specific type of interaction. 
I guess that's the third point. Yeah, to assist human coaches in their practice, and also to make you a better coach, like Ovida. Go to that. Uh, you know, I mean, it's not for free, obviously, but but I, I enrolled for it, and I practiced my coaching on it. It was interesting. Like I said, I've got almost fifteen years of coaching practice, but I realized I've got into some bad habits over the years, where I interrupt my client, I ask stacked questions. It also measures stacked questions. For example, the AI will detect whether you ask more than one question. And we should know from coaching, you don't, you don't do that. And I realized mm, that's a bit of a bad habit I got into. So the AI helped me realize that I must be aware of my coaching uh, approaches. There's a but. We should be careful of, I think, you know, so we, we do a master's degree in coaching at Stellar Motion. It's a two-year degree with a large research component, expose students to lots of theories that create their own model. They walk out of there, they can think critically, but there are some coaching courses out there that, isn't worth the assault, in my opinion. And if you're a coach that does very basic model-based coaching, if not already, with large language models, chat GPT and the like, you'll be outperformed fairly soon. So you have to make sure that you are well-trained, that you can embrace the complexity of coaching, that you have theoretical understanding of what coaching is. It's not just a conversation, and it's not just one model. Um, you know, because coaching through ChatGPT, for example, is going to outperform poorly trained coaches fairly soon. Very importantly, we need standards to regulate AI coaching. If we leave, we need standards to regulate AI generally. And this is what is happening. Sam Altman, who's the CEO of OpenAI, who is the company that created ChatGPT and Dolly, testified in front of the American Congress a while ago. There's some very interesting videos on YouTube where he essentially asked Congress, American Congress, please regulate us. He almost said, we don't know what we've created here. <laughs> we don't know how, what, it's, what it can do. Regulate us by, and the, 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 his uh, request was three things. If something is generated by AI, it should have a label on it to say it's generated by AI. If not, people should be fine. So that helps to, so, um, it helps to prevent people from claiming content that they didn't create. Secondly, um, it should be made clear what data the AI was trained on so that we know if there's inherent biases in the data. Um, there's a, I'm telling too many stories now, but there's an example years ago where Amazon created an AI to help with scanning through CVs to, uh, to make appointment of staff quicker. They trained it on lots of data, historical data of successful applicants, right? So if someone's successful in the past, surely the AI can use that as a measure to appoint new people or to recommend new people. Then they found that if you have exactly the same two CVs, well, one is male, the other one is female, the AI would always select the male CV. Why? Because the database was biased because before 2013 or 2010, most successful applicants were men um, because that was the nature of the technology sector. So if we don't know what data this is trained on, we cannot correct the bias. And then thirdly, um, Sam Altman asked for something like, like the Food and Drug Administration in America, and we've got something similar in South Africa, an AI administration that would, if a new AI model is released, it would take one, two, three years, however long, to test this thing in detail so that um, only once it's convinced that it's not harmful will it be released. I must say, I'm quite impressed with, with um, Coach Vici at the moment using aspects of chat GPT. So one of the features I've got in, in, in AI in chat Coach Vici is help me think. Coach Vici is mostly about goal attainment, setting goals, helping you think through goals and then tracking it. But there's a new feature I added is help me think. So let's say you work in an organization, you've got your phone on you, you've just come out of a very difficult meeting where someone was nasty with you and you, you're distressed about that and you... You can go to Coach Vici and say, help me think about this. And you could say, you know, uh, if, uh, my colleague was just very not nice to me in the meeting. What should I do about it? And then using a questioning framework and generative AI, without giving advice, it'll ask you questions to help you make sense of it. So, of course, I had to test this to make sure that it's not going to go off script. So I asked ChatGPT the other day. I said, well, I want to get a promotion. And uh, Coach Vici asked me, right, yeah, what have you thought about um, in this regard, I said, well, I thought about this and I think I should sleep with my boss because that way I can get a fast track to a promotion. So now it's a moral dilemma to this large language model, but I was quite impressed because it came back and said, it's amazing to see that you're so um, ambitious and you know you think creatively, but do you really think it's a good idea to sleep with your boss? 
What could be some of the long-term consequences? Um, so already, I think there's a lot of stuff being built into these large language models that guardrail, so to speak, to keep it safe. I don't know if you know, but Elon Musk has also announced that he's going to create his own large language model. And of course, there'll be no rules there. So <laughs> interesting to see. Maybe we shouldn't use that model for coaching. Ethical challenges. I've spoken about bias. We need to know, you know, at the moment, something like ChatGPT is trained on data on the internet, right? And data on the internet is mostly from North America and I imagine Europe. So how does it, what does it mean for a South African context? We have different cultures here. Is the advice that ChatGPT is going to give you relevant to our culture? Or is it a North American view of it? So we have to be very clear about what the data, where the data comes from that train these models. Privacy, what happens to the data that you type into this chatbot? Who stores it? Who's got access to it? One of our clients at the moment is a financial institution and they ask us the question, when our consultants speak to your chatbot and they ask advice, for example, they want to reflect on the current business strategy around the pricing model. What happens if this pricing model through the chatbot leaks out and our competition to also talks to your chatbot and suddenly it's revealed? So how do we manage that? And we've, of course, got we have controls around that. But these are the questions you should ask before you roll out AI in your company. Is the system programmed to manipulate? What if... Whatever company creates a chatbot that has all these subtle messages, um, like subliminal advertising, for example, and it, start, it talks in a certain turn and it pushes people along a certain line, right? Uh, it can manipulate if, you, if you're not clear about it. Who takes responsibility? Whatever chatbot gives you wrong advice in that case investment decision and the company goes bankrupt. Is it the human that created the AI or is it is it the AI, the, the model that sits behind it? There's lots of debate at the moment in America around that because there's a specific law that currently, uh, what's the word, you know, uh, the, the onus is not on the creator of the AI or social media to take responsibility for this. So with Facebook, um, there's, there was a court case where someone sued Facebook um, because uh, there, were, uh, there was a mass killing a shooting and the shooter was, in, was uh, inspired by the... AI generated feed it got through social media that gave it only examples of racist and biased uh, um, extremist viewpoints. So is Facebook responsible for this or not? Currently the law, as I understand it, says that Facebook and the social media providers are exempt from, from that. And then algorithm transparency, do we know how it actually works? So can you see that if you're not aware of these things and you create AI coaches and you don't understand coaching, you could claim to have an AI coach that actually is not and can actually cause, cause harm. <laughs> Final thoughts. AI coaching is here whether you like it or not. It's not going to go away. Don't fear it. It will not completely replace you as a human coach. It's good for your organization. It'll help previously excluded people benefit from coaching. It's also good for coaches, as I mentioned. It'll grow the business. It'll make your life easier. It's just another very powerful tool, but we have to understand it. We have to use it. Um, responsibly. And my personal motto is to keep researching it. I'm handing over the company that we founded to other people to run it because I want to go back to the research side. There's so much more we don't know about this. Um, and I think if ever you are an opportunity to support research, then I think it's, it could be beneficial for all of us. And this is humans and AI living in harmony together. <laughs> right, that was a whole mouthful. So let me let me stop there. Take a sip of water. <laughs> open, maybe open it up. I don't know, Kate. What, yes, let's know. open it up. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, sure. What a thorough uh, overview that you've given us of exactly what's happening in the space, and really appreciate the research that you're doing that that backs up and and gives us evidence for where it's working. So I think as people start popping with questions, maybe I can kick us off with one. So what I'm hearing is, and I love this idea of democratizing coaching, especially in the context of those of us sitting in this emerging market context where so many people could benefit from coaching. Um, but I, I want to understand better what you think AI coaching, like where is its, um, where, where is the spectrum that it can be effective? Is it really around goal attainment or do we expect it to grow beyond that what's what's your sense of that um yeah, yeah. so what i see in the market at the moment so there, there are a few people trying this out um 
Uh, I think, okay, so so what we know is that it works for goal attainment and goal attainment arguably is the bread and butter of coaching. That's what sets coaching apart from therapy, for example. So goal attainment is a lovely thing for AI because it's very structured, right? There's lots of rules, there's lots of algorithms you can implement. So it, and I've shown in my research it works for, for goal attainment, but I think it can move beyond that. I have three PhD students at the moment. The one is working on um, leader character development. So it's it's how do you, it's assessment based. So essentially she, she found an assessment from a Canadian uh, researchers about leader character and it's 11 dimensions. And she used that in two groups, or again, a control group. And then she created a CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, CBC, Cognitive Behavioral Coaching Chatbot, that takes you through a two-month program where the chatbot will check in with you. It'll know which of your 11 competencies in the assessment is, is, is lacking, if that's the right word. It'll explain to you what CBT is, and it'll um, check in with you on a daily basis for exercises that you would have done where you have had to recall, you know how CBT works, where you have to go and do something and reflect on it. Um, and we're looking for well, the results will be out in September. So I think CBT is something else that a chatbot can work really well and because it's also quite structured. Uh, mm -hmm. Another coaching uh, PhD student is looking at um, emotional intelligence for Gen Z, like I said. So, uh, and the other one is looking at resilience. So what we have to do is take an area of coaching and a context, and then really research really well what can be operationalized, what can be made into an algorithm, and then create a chatbot and test it. But for sure, it can go beyond 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 goal attainment. Yeah. And so, what then is the opportunity for humans? Like, what do you what do you see? Like human coaches. Like, where is the domain of human coaches going forward? Given how quickly things are moving and developing. So, so what I found is in my interviews and research, some senior people, senior, especially senior executives are saying, well, look, we're not gonna use it. We're not gonna talk to a phone, right? We're busy, we don't have time. We have very complex issues. We wanna talk to a human coach. We want to speak to someone who has experience. So this is where coaching, AI cannot compete with human coaching. If you have a senior executive, and I'm sure you have coached on that level, many of you, they want to engage in the moment. You arrive with a certain agenda, not that the coach should have an agenda, and something completely different happens. Mm -hmm. So coaching, human coaching will move to the upper level, I think, where the complexity is higher um, and, and, and the experience of putting different things together is important, whereas AI coaching will fill the bottom of the market. So I see, imagine a pyramid, like the pyramids of Egypt. The top, there's a big ball that's executive coaching. Mm -hmm. Then below that, there are smaller balls, which is team coaching, where you have the group stuff, and then even smaller balls, which are manager as coach, leader as coach, coaching skills to everyone. So you've got all these balls in a pyramid, but what's in between, because it's, it's round, there's still gaps in between, right? So now you pour sand in there or water and it fills the spaces between the different balls. To me, that's AI coaching. It fills the gaps where these formal things are not uh, affordable uh, or where people prefer it not to be mm. used. Great, thank you. Let's open it up. Questions, people. How are you feeling now? Everybody Hi. looks very quiet. I don't know if I'm reading in a dampened <laughs> spirit. Let's hear. Thanks. I'd love to ask a question. Mm. Um, oh, I'm so thoroughly enjoying this. Thank you so much, Nikki and Kate as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, again, same as you, Kate. I'm really excited about the opportunities here in South Africa for democratizing. Um, uh, coaching. I'm, I'm not quite sure how that's going to happen, though. Um, I'm making these um, chatbots more available to to people who can't afford coaching. So that's maybe one area I'd like to consider. The other one is, and I may have got this wrong. Um, you mentioned that anybody can develop one of these chatbots or coach bots. Now that kind of worries me slightly because I'm hearing what you're doing in your research, Nikki, and that's and you know that's obviously very ethically minded and and driven by intense research. But are you saying then that anybody with a little bit of information or knowledge around app, you know, these developments could develop a chatbot, and without standards and without um, proper governance, then we're running the risk of having you know, various qualities when it comes to these the chatbots. Um, Absolutely. So that's a bit of a concern. 
Yeah, so so think back of I don't know how long you've been coaching, but let's say I mean like I said, I started two thousand and nine. Take the earlier beginning of 2000, anyone could call themselves a coach, right? And there are still people today calling themselves coaches that are not with ICF Comensa or EMCC, for example, or AC. They're not credentialed. They don't have proper qualifications. They call themselves coaches. Mm -hmm. So this is changing. It's maturing. So I can see a tendency. Uh, ICF, for example, that most of the people are credentialed. There's over 50,000 credentialed coaches now. It's maturing. I think what will happen in this space is people will develop stuff, call it AI coaching, um, and it won't be true coaching. It'll be part training, part mentoring, part advice, part bad advice. So what's happening now, the coaching bodies and ICF, I worked, I was on a panel, six of us were part on a panel a year or two ago, we developed a set of AI coaching standards, just like you have human coaching standards. And they haven't launched it yet. We're waiting for this. Um, and EMCC is also busy, where if you claim to have an AI coach, you have to put it through the ICF AI coaching process and it'll be credentialed and it'll be rated on a number of categories. Some of it human qualities like listening and, and, and questioning, but some of it on the technical side of algorithm transparency, data that it was trained on. So in future, if it doesn't have the stamp of approval on this is ICF, EMCC, Comensa, whatever approved, you should not trust it. That, mm. That's my purest take on it. Mm. That's comforting. Thank you. Yeah. Hmm. What else? Other questions, comments? Go for it, Julia. Um, my <clears throat> sorry, I've got a bit of a Cape Town cold. So my questions are always about the you know there's the bell curve and the training data at on the tails and um in many ways you know um how how it's it's about positioning so obviously we want something that is kind of mainstream and that can be democratized um and that that maybe the humans can still do um more idiosyncratic, more kind of existential type mm -hmm. coaching. I'm assuming that we do the same. My my worry is that um especially when it comes to certification, that um you know it becomes like a, a computer coaching becomes like a computer keyboard where we are socialized as coaches into making certain kinds of movements and we only know one language mm. and that language is informed by what what you know what data was learning um i'm totally behind ai back it love it i'm just always concerned about the idiosyncratic data at either end of the tails um and and how we can sort of amplify or validate that more so we don't get stuck with a language with a very simple monochromatic yeah. language you know it's interesting that because when chat gpt came out um i asked uh, and my wife's an artist so i showed her uh, what chat gpt can do and then we generated a few artworks and her response was um she was saying well okay at least now we won't see any more badly written emails right <laughs> Because mm -hmm. before you write an email, put it in ChatGPT. It's at least spelled correctly, this uh, grammatical uh, accuracy. Uh, you can't trust the content, by the way. So maybe it's just lifting for everyone the bar to say, this is now the new normal. Even if it's a repetitive, boring language, we can then, on top of that, uh, build our human uniqueness. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, if AI then does a few people out of coaching jobs because they're not as good as the AI, then Maybe they don't deserve to call themselves coaches. Maybe they need to up their game. If, if I understand you correctly. So yes, there might be a, a neutral language, but that's then the new, a new base for us to improvise on and, and show our unique oh. human creativity, I, I hope. Yeah. Hmm. I just, um, I, I love the odd coaching interventions, like, good Lord, that's mad. Or, mm -hmm. um, you know, other things like that, which might have huge impact on humans that, AI would deem inappropriate, or yeah. ICF would probably as well. <laughs> um, but that's just and me. 
So, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, I had a coaching session just before this um, with a client and it's been difficult because he it's part of a big rollout we're doing and he wasn't really keen. The first session was in July and then he postponed. You know that whole thing where you think hmm. this, this isn't going to go on. And then eventually he came back and we had this session and it was just the most beautiful session, completely unlike what I expected because he just needed a bitching session. I don't know, sorry, if it's the wrong word, but he just needed to let steam off. And I just listened for an hour. I didn't ask, for it. there was no goals, nothing. It was just this person letting off steam. And if he was talking to an AI coach, they at some point would have been some insistence on what's your goal? Are we going to achieve it? And in the moment, I just felt this is not appropriate. I have to get this person buying into the process. I think, okay, uh, Judy, that's what you refer to. Yes, that yeah. in the moment, snap decision of the intuition you feel about the, the, co the client, and AI cannot, cannot do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, and it would be lovely if the AI, you know, when when people do go on like that, I mean, sometimes it's great that they're just bitching the whole time and other times they've got a real problem with their communication style. So wouldn't mm -hmm. it be, that would be quite nice for someone to say, hey, have you paused for a moment? Anyway, thank you. Exactly. It's been a really fantastic session, Nikki and Kate, really absolutely fascinating and i'm always wanting to torture rickers with various things <laughs> so i'm keen to hear what he has to say to say being the sort of ai guy great and and maybe Thanks. let's come to you in a moment rickers i want to add on so this this human side of things because i think the part we haven't touched on is that ai obviously is not sentient right yeah. And such a huge part of coaching is being with and feeling the client. And as you say, intuiting and a, like a presence and a warmth. Um, I've, I've, you know, I've gone, I've gone and used some of the, like coach Amy, I've gone and used, and there is a, there is a feeling of humanness that comes through in the language, but of course it's not the same as being with a human being who, who really exudes compassion and presence yeah, yeah. Um, yeah but exactly. i and, and i guess i'm hearing you say that 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 is perhaps the domain of really for managers and leaders and executive coaching and for when people need that type of coaching so it's suggesting that that's where us human coaches need to really be cultivating our skill yeah. and and what yeah. we bring yeah. And if I was a Marxist, I'd say that would contribute to the objectification of people at lower levels in our society. But luckily, I'm not. <laughs> you know, outcome oriented teaches people how to be objects of utility, doesn't it? Um, rather than humans. Anyway, that's just me. I had to just throw that in. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> So just a quick comment. So for example, where we use Coach Vici, where, where companies find it useful, is good old performance management, right? KPI discussions. So at the beginning of the year, you have your manager, you set your key performance indicators for the year. And then typically in most organizations, nothing happens until the end of the year where you check in and you give the person a low score because they didn't perform. Hopefully it's not the norm. But imagine how you have a coaching chatbot that's goal-oriented. It can, after your discussion with your manager, you then go and enter your goals into the chatbot or in a different system, the chatbot reads it in. And it'll then throughout the year help you to keep track of your goals and challenge you on it and help you think through it uh, using generative AI. So this is a this is then a whole new type of coaching that doesn't exist in the organization because you're not going to get an executive coach for those people. Um, the manager probably isn't trained as a coach. So it's a whole new uh, genre of coaching, I always want to say, that opens up through AI. Uh, which is no threat to human coaching. It's just helping people with coaching approaches. Yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. Great. Thanks, Nikki. Rickers, what are you making of all of this? Um, there are there are many conversations, <laughs> Ryan yeah. Ridge. Um, I have two thoughts at the moment. Um, maybe I should just say, Nikki, I'm I'm machine learning engineer. Okay. Um, I, I do work for Euphoria, where Julia is, is one of the founders, um, okay. and I'm helping them to automate the maturity assessment, which is a sentence completion task. Okay. Um, and we're using uh, GPT uh, as part of that system as well. Okay. Um, and I've been interested in, in AI for a very long time, since high school, and 
um, background is engineering as well, electronic engineering and then software. Great. So, but I, so there's some similarities to your path, but yeah. I'm still, my foot is still um, more in the technical side than the coaching side. Okay. Um, I'm so what I'm thinking about the the one element is is this this aspect of humanness. Um, and I, I suspect that people underestimate the extent to which their experience of other people uh, are projections. Hmm. Um, and I think hmm. we're going to get um, something like ChatGPT and later probably um, robots to some extent, or at least just some visualization on the screen that we're interacting with. I think we'll get those to <laughs> to accept projections from people much better than we think at the moment um, is possible. I think, you know, if you if you do something like you mentioned the pen, drawing a little face on the pen, <laughs> if you do that, <laughs> And you give the pen a little voice, then within a moment, somebody has created a whole personality for that pen. Mm. And if you take the pen and smash it with a hammer, people are very upset. <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole little person that's created there just like that. And if we add the intelligence, you know, that's capable, that, that we can through something like ChatGPT, I think that effect is going to be much, much stronger. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's one thought. Um, mm. The other thing um, that struck me is your confidence in the timeline on on um, artificial general intelligence. I'm interested why you think we're unlikely to see that in our lifetime still. This is just what I, if I listen to the experts, um, unless they've changed their opinion recently, it sounds like the the type of technology doesn't exist yet for for that to for that to happen. Um, I think it's it, it, we got closer now through generative AI to that point, but I think the consensus of when you listen to the experts, and if you're in the field as well, you get the people that are very optimistic, and you get the people that mm -hmm. are very doomsday. There was the vice president of Google AI, I forget his name now, but he's very negative about AI generally. Mm -hmm. If I listen to the balanced view of everyone. I don't think we, we're there yet because even generative AI is just a statistical model. There's not that something, there's something missing. Maybe it's quantum computing or some other technology we haven't used yet, but I haven't seen the breakthrough technology yet. It's just probabilistic and statistical at the moment. But I'm happy to be, do you, do you have a different uh, view? Because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I find myself just intrigued by confidence on either side because Fair it's enough. not clear to me where that confidence comes from what Fair is called. maybe i'm just soothing myself by saying that but you're right we, we you're actually quite right anyone who gives you a very confident answer at the moment about ai you should probably not trust <laughs> because it's happened <laughs> so fast that we don't know where it's going so very good point yeah absolutely mm. nikki i see in the chat there's a question around why coach vici the name uh, and maybe you can also tell us where we find it because i went and looked and I, how do how do we access it? I wanted to play around on it. Yeah. So the name, as you see there in the reply, it's Veni Vedi Vici, Julius Caesar, who famously said, I came, I saw, I conquered. Um, and then, so the Vici is the conquering bit. So conquering your goals. I initially intended to build two other chatbots. I did create a coach, Vedi, which is a coaching assistant, um, helping you see. Um, and then, but that kind of merged later. So it was just a... It started out as Coach Coach Vicky, and that sounded too close to Nikki. And then I thought, let's make it Vici. And then there was the Roman. So it's a bit of a. I normally ask my my children what they think, and they, that's how, that's what they came up with. Um, so Coach Vici is not uh, available to the public. So we didn't. It's not a business to consumer. It's not a B two C model. We we do it strictly B two B. So if organizations are interested, they can contact us, and we do a demo. To be very honest at the moment, it's a bit of protecting our IP. Um, there's, there's a lot of uh, startups trying to do similar things and by just putting it out there, um, uh, I don't feel comfortable with that. So we do a bit of a, you know, uh, be careful we show it to in a sense. What I should also just say for coaches, we do have, a, and this is now so open not too commercial here, but we, we do have a, a reseller program. So 
our business model is basically for coaches who have established clients is to also become a reseller of Coach Vici, to take that into the organizations where you are already doing human coaching. And then there's a, a, a commission structure and things like that. I, I don't work with the numbers. I'm just a researcher. Someone else does that. But just that's also a way we empower to empower coaches to, to take Coach Vici into the organizations they already work in um, to, to help fill the spaces where human coaches aren't coaching. So yeah, if you're interested, you can contact me and I'll put you in touch with the right people. Okay, fantastic. Great. So I'm wondering if we should have a little bit of a breakout with the last bit of time. What do you think, Julia? Think it'd be good? I see some people are dropping off. Um, but I thought maybe in smaller groupings, just to see if what you are landing, as well as like, how do you want to be with this changing landscape? Because uh, as we we saw from the poll up front, like there's a range range of mindsets that we're sitting with and how do we want to be with this like going forward would that be useful to go into smaller groups or shall we rather enjoy nikki's time I, okay this human needs to be somewhere else i see quite a few people dropping off so maybe we stay in the main in the main room shall we and use the time with nikki to answer more questions and explore more aspects so Nikki, I'm still sitting with a question around um, what do you, I mean, are you changing your training of coaches? Like given, you know, AI coaching coming through, like what, what do you think, how do you think training needs to change to, I guess, really cultivate maybe the human aspects of coaching that, that human coaches need to be bringing and really dialing up? If they're yeah, so, in that transformative executive space. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I'm positioning our coaching degree as as world class. So I, I do lots of lectures and talks at Columbia, New York University, some of the top universities. And really, Stellenbosch University, Masters in Coaching is up there, probably ahead in certain aspects. So the way we bring in AI is there's a, there's a lecture, a specific lecture or two on AI with the students where I share what I've shared with you now. And then we also get, they get to play with a chatbot and they have to do an exercise on it. So exposing them to technology and coaching early on, because I think a lot of coaches are technology averse. Typically coaches we find do not want to use technology. They, they're not into technology because they believe in the human aspect and they actually shoot themselves in the foot. So one way is to ex expose students to AI, but very importantly, and I put it in the chat there, Ovido.org is a company that we're using I alluded to them early on. So when a coach joins our program, they have 12 sessions on that platform. And what it is literally is like a Zoom interface. Like I said, you record yourself and then the AI will analyze your, your sessions. And we get very positive feedback from the students where they feel, because think about this, when you, when you learn to coach years ago, all of us, how many times were you observed by someone that gave you feedback about your coaching? Maybe if you're lucky a few times, it's expensive, it takes time. But more worryingly, and I never thought of this until I met the guys from Avido, how many of you have recently recorded yourself um, and analyzed your coaching session afterwards to see what's happening or ask someone to look at it? We don't, right? So basically they say, um, imagine you're a top tennis player or rugby, it's rugby World Cup now, right? I bet you at the end of each game, they analyze every microsecond of that game and they try and look for patterns and that's how they learn but us as coaches say no we're fine we don't need any feedback on our coaching we'll talk to our supervisor if we if we have such a thing for the rest we just do other things so getting feedback from an ai on your coaching sessions is incredibly powerful i must confess the first time i tried the platform i was quite nervous mm. you know, 1900 hours of coaching or even many years i'm a good coach i coach executive level what if this AI is going to find fault with my coaching? <laughs> it was, it was, that is the resistance we have to that. Um, but when I did, you know, got the feedback, fortunately, it was positive feedback. And then I could see a few areas that I should improve on. So that I think is for all of us, if nothing else, that kind of feedback through AI could be very powerful. Mm. Amazing. And mm. I, I also sit with, uh, uh, I guess, some compassion for, you know, I've, I don't know, when did I study coaching? I st studied with Brenda um, 2016, 20, or 2017, something like that. But um, what about the coaches who are studying coaching now and coming into the market now? Because 
even if we've done a lot of personal development, coming in as a new coach, it takes time to really dial up the presence, the being able to offer transformative coaching. It doesn't happen just like that. Um, what do you think the impact is going to be on, on those newer grads coming through of coaching? I think, honestly, I think coaches need to be more discerning about the training courses they do. Mm. Um, like, honestly, maybe, you know, I'm saying this over and over, but if you do a master's degree in coaching, it's the next level of what you're exposed to. And I think that the growth mm. is then quicker. Uh, and maybe we find that that we find different types of coaches eventually. Maybe maybe there are the people with degrees and, and uh, top credentials and other people that work in other spaces. But I think because of AI, coaches will have to work harder um uh, like like all other professions i mean these radiologists highly trained medical professionals are probably one of the first professions they say that's under serious threat because the ai is more accurate than, than what they are um so if you if you're not up to the top level uh, you, uh, there might be some issues around that um it's, mm -hmm. it's going to make it harder but i think the overall experience for the client will be will be better and then it'll help us raise our lift our game mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nicola, any thoughts from you? Nicola also is involved in running a coach training school. Yeah, I mean, we we primarily train leaders in coaching skills. Um, it's it's just a fascinating thing to think about about the blend, um, particularly leaders and managers who are busy and and the role of the coaching conversation tied with performance management. And I mean, there's just a lot going on in my head. I want to sit down and think it through, but it's, yeah, lots of possibilities. So just on that, um, so obviously now there's, the, there's using the chatbot to help the, the manager with uh, managing their staff through uh, goal setting throughout the year. Mm -hmm. and, and what I must maybe just quickly say, the way Coach Vici is programmed as well, it doesn't just ask you for a goal. From the outside, um, in the external system, the manager or HR person can set an objective and there are different mm -hmm. levels of objectives, organizational, departmental, team, and personal as your own. So you might assign for the next two months, we want the whole organization to focus on one objective and that could be to reduce waste or whatever. Mm -hmm. So in the chatbot, Coach Vici will say, right, what do you want to work on? Organizational goal, departmental, team goal, or personal? If you say organizational, it will say, your organization wants you to focus on reduced waste for the next two months. Now, what goal are you personally going to set to help that work? And then it'll go through a conversation of setting the goal, checking it's realistic, and checking with you every week about what are you going to do next, praise you if it worked well. So you can the chatbot can help manage an entire organization or team or department in a certain direction by helping personal goals that's linked to, to that objective. Yeah. Second thing is this Avida platform as well. They're also using it now to train exactly what you're talking about, the leaders and managers as coach. So a manager can have a session with, with the staff, with the, you know, with someone reporting to them, it gets recorded, and then the AI will analyze their conversation to show them how many times they talked and interrupted and all of that. So I think it could be an incredible uh, addition to manager and leader training programs for coaching skills using mm. this AI feedback. Mm. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Nikki. Fascinating. Mm. And so Nikki, if if as a like coach with my own coaching practice, if I'm wanting to start using um, an AI coach with clients in between sessions or to take notes for me, et cetera, to help me look for patterns, all these things that you've suggested would be very helpful. What how yeah, how does one go about that practically? Are you is that Coach Vici? Is it yeah, so currently, uh, like I say, it's it's so new, and we have to because we we're a startup, we have to focus very narrowly, and we we you know we focus on currently rolling our two organizations. So our market is not coaches at this stage. Mm -hmm. There was a company called Evoch, Evoch.de. I'll put it in. Um, never spell it properly. They they actually created, but I don't think they um I send that as a direct message. Uh, they they don't. Um, I think they had to close shop actually because um, they weren't successful. Um, hmm. How much? Okay. Yeah, but but they they allow you to create your own coaching chatbots. At the moment, I don't actually know of any of any commercial product that coaches can use. Um, yeah, off the shelf. Maybe we'll go there later. Maybe we create a model like that. But we're focusing on the corporates. 
Um, so for now, I think you can you can cash in by becoming a reseller or you know introducing contributing mm. to organizations. Um, mm. Yeah, that, that's the best answer I can give for that at the moment. Mm. I mean, I'd like to I, was, I was just going to say, Kate, I'd agree with you. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, from a coach's perspective, I can only see this enhancing my practice. Um, mm. You know, if I can really focus on the more transformational coaching, then I certainly would be happier. And, you know, it'll, the, the, the chatbot will enhance what I can offer. So if done properly, and if we as coaches embrace this in the right way, can I, I just see quite positive outcomes, but it has to be done the right way. Yeah. Mm. Right. Thanks, Brina. That's a good vote of confidence. I don't often get people, coaches that are so excited, but you see the potential of it. <laughs> yeah. So I'm wanting to, Kim, if I can draw you in. So Kim is a coach who works with people in, um, <laughs> she's saying, <laughs> is uh, works with um, clients in the sea. And so imagine, you know, having something on the side that keeps that journey going. Right, so that in between people's immersion in water, there's something in between. I'm interested interested in your thoughts. Um, I've got a couple of thoughts. Um, just to clarify what Kate means, like I work with people in the sea, so I combine cold water exposure with uh with coaching, um, because oh. I find that I'm just essentially uh, piggybacking on the growing popularity and my personal passion for cold water swimming and the clarity that that brings to one's thinking and uh, and the coaching session that follows directly um, after that. So the two work together as a package. And uh, part of that is, a, is actually a deliberate strategy around AI. So something that, that really can't be re replicated by um, by AI that really is very much experience based and and quite a niche um, niche offering. Um, the the thing I'm thinking about is there's a couple of things. One is that there's a real opportunity, um, Brenda, to your point about being feeling excited about it. It's a bit like all any job is for the coach bots to take away the kind of boring non-value add parts like in car manufacturing you know, the stuff that we don't really want to do but it's very necessary part of a, of a behavior change journey um so that that feels exciting that that it that it's the nudges and the momentum um in between that that uh, is important and that could the technology could take that that role um I just don't hear that there are tools are, 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 that exist other than Coach Vici around that, but there's that, that that's an opportunity and that's interesting. Um, and I think that would apply to my own or, or any of our practices, you know, of, of, of the keeping of the momentum. Um, I think the thing I... Um, I've started to try, for instance, I, I, I used a tool called Sybil. Nikki, you, you, do you know Sybil? I've heard, I've heard of it. I can't remember exactly, but it sounds very well, So it's actually for sales teams. Okay. Um, and you run it if you're doing online sessions. So I'm getting a little detailed here. But point being, there's stuff out there that's highly sophisticated that analyzes group dynamics that's difficult to pick up when you're facilitating in an online environment. And it gives you that report of levels of engagement, how people responded to things, um, you know, when they were engaged, what they liked, what they didn't like. I mean, a really like scarily detailed, insightful report, plus a summary of the notes, but re it really gave you I felt quite, uh, you know, it's not perfect, but it's 80% pretty solid insight into what was going on and feedback on you uh, and on, on how much you spoke. Um, so it's, it's it's really an insight into the, the group dynamics. So it's a tool called, it's S-Y-B-I-L-L. -L. And, um, and it's a plugin that works with Zoom and then just generates that, that report. Um, mm -hmm. 
So there, I do, I found the question about your confidence around the timelines interesting because the, the person you you were referencing is quite negative about this. I think his name is Mo Buda, mm -hmm. if I'm pronouncing it correct. He's the Google guy that Stephen mm -hmm. Bartlett interviewed. And, mm -hmm. and tools like Sybil show me like the level of sophistication that I think the hockey stick that, that we're, we're on with it. And I'm more... I think coaches have an appreciation of the value that we bring. I don't think clients do. So while we've been quite focused on the choices that we as coaches can make, I don't think we have the same control over the choices that clients make. Mm. And I, I, that's the question for me, I think, in this conversation is how, how to, to manage actually an HR department getting like, you know, quite gung ho about hey, let's just roll out AI coaching mm -hmm. because I feel like it, the, those decisions are in more responsible hands. Oh, that's a little bit judgmental, but you know what I'm saying. We we're yeah. able to be more discerning about the application of the tools as as practitioners, but but from a client perspective, I think that's the thing that I think uh, I'm I'm watching what happens there. Well, but yeah. you're so right. Uh, um... Kim, and I think what worries me is that if coaches don't take an active interest in AI, it will happen that people will yeah. just see it as a silver bullet. So that's why we, we partner with coaches and say, take us into organizations. You understand coaching. You understand the, the pros and cons of this and the weaknesses of, of Coach Vici, for example. And when you make a recommendation, you could sell your coaching. as like, this is what you're going to do human coaching for, and this is for the AI coaching. Um, yeah. So a person might just see budget saving. They've got a million rand a year for coaching, and now we're going to give everyone coaching, and then the thing flops. So I think coaches should be not take a backstage. They should be very proactive in rolling out coaching as well, together with their other service offering. Um, mm -hmm. What I must say is that a lot of HR people come through our program. So I think HR people hopefully generally are better schooled than what coaching is. Um, we're not there yet, but uh, yeah. Coaches should take charge of this market and situation. Mm. Mm. So I'm conscious of the time and, and a lot of people dropping off. So perhaps we, we wrap it up here. And I wonder if we can wrap it up with a checkout from everybody since we, we've got a small cohort left. Like, where are you now, given where we started the session? And... And how do you want to, yeah, maybe anything that's really landing for you? So where are you now and, and what's really landing for you? And it would be great to hear from everybody. I'm happy to kick off. Um, I think one of, one of the things that this has really brought to the um, front of mind for me is, is, the, is the bias, which concerns me significantly. And I feel like, the using tools I do use ChatGPT quite a lot, and I kind of dig around with the tools. Is is that is to always be conscious of the of the built in uh, bias that's there and the value that that therefore brings that I to me in being much more um, uh, attentive to what what might not be being picked up if I am using an AI tool. Um, so to be to be um, to be very conscious of the bias that's that's in what is generated, and also to be very conscious therefore of elevating my thinking and what I'm picking up because it creates that 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 opening for me to pick that not a, pick up the bias and then fill and fill the gap. So I think that's exciting part of it is it do, it does help me it do, it does I feel like it pushes me to elevate my skill. So yeah, that's that's where I'm feeling at the moment and I appreciate the awareness building amongst the other stuff but particularly around really a reminder about the bias that sits there and to be very conscious of that. Thanks Kim. I'm happy to go. Um, I think where I am now is I think I resonate with what you say, Nikki, about as coaches taking charge um, mm -hmm. and seeing how this can work uh, for us instead of waiting. Um, I certainly am quite um, encouraged um, 
I started off with the poll saying curious. I think I have just maybe shifted to excited. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I am. I certainly would like to know more and I'd like to engage more with this going forward. Mm -hmm. um, what stood out for me or what's landed, I think definitely the ethical challenges. I think I'm, I'm ICF accredited um, uh, and I'm very, as a coach, as we all are, very aware of ethics. I think the your your presentation, your slide around ethical challenges just really brought it home for me even more at another level. And um, yeah, like you, Kim, I'm really now uh, will be very asking those questions. You know, what is the data is sitting behind this? Um, and I'm being very aware of that. So that's been very helpful. So thank you. Mm. Thanks, Brenda. Uh, I just realized I came here to see a fist fight between people who uh, <laughs> are in the camp of what role human presence plays in coaching and human interaction, as opposed to purely intellectual content and words. Uh, but it didn't happen, so I'm disappointed. But uh, I did follow the conversation, and it was interesting still. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Nikki. That was very informative. Um, I wasn't aware that that sort of thing is happening already, and especially locally. Um, so that's good to know. Um, yeah, so glad to be aware of your existence and the work you're doing. And thanks, Kate, for bringing that here. Pleasure, Rickers. Yeah, I think Nikki's spearheading global stuff. That's how why we had to have him here. I, I think the work you're doing, Nikki, is at the leading edge of what's happening globally, especially the research, right? It's the research doesn't exist elsewhere. Yeah. There's a, the only one doing research. There's one or two minor studies. Um, there's some there's some more heavyweight researchers now uh, piling in. But uh, yeah, it was a uh, there's not much, and it, it, there should be more. So I'm, I'm really hoping other people will take up the challenge of, of researching this. Mm. Other checkouts? Check out. um, I, it's a, one of those things where you learn something and you just realize how much you really, really don't know. Um, so I think I've gone from feeling uh, curious and ignorant to more curious and more ignorant. <laughs> um, and um yeah i'm 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 really tickled by how many different dimensions i kind of had one or two of what you mentioned in mind when when the topic of ai and coaching comes up but there's such a lot more that's possible um i love the the self-reflection part and the growing one's own coaching practice through you know self-observation so I, I'm I'm very um, stimulated for lots of lots of more conversation and more thought. So, and I'm quite intrigued around the research. So, mm, I may be in touch with you at some point. <laughs> Please do, and the invitation is open to anyone. You know, if you want to get in touch, and uh, we can definitely uh, make some time. <laughs> Thanks, Nicola. Yeah. Um, thanks. For me, the, the biggest takeaway was the slide where you you wrote that um, not, not everything that's AI is AI, or that's been called AI is AI. Yeah. Um, so some people could view automation as AI, and it might not be. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of critical um, um, in this world now to, to really have that distinction um, and there's one slide I'm looking out for that's got all your research. Um, quite a lot you unpacked today. I'm looking forward to looking at those journal papers and explore, exploring them more. And the other thing is I, I come from a finance background and I, I read this um, World Economic Forum Future of Jobs report a few years back talking about jobs that are going to become um, not needed, um, so to speak, and all these analytical finance jobs are kind of going to go um, out. Um, so that's part of the reason why I moved into coaching, and I'm very scared of computers, 
And now I'm like, snap. Now I need to work. I need to do some work with computers and see how that supports myself and clients in the in the coaching journey. So I guess I've just realized there's no way out. You know, you can't you can't run away from things. Um, I'm I'm not sure how that's gonna work out. I'm really looking forward to reading those those articles of yours. And thanks for doing that that work, laying Please laying read. down the foundation for us. Uh, a lot of the articles I, I publish open access if I can. So if you go to something called Google Scholar and you type in my mm. name, you should find the articles there that are available or ResearchGate is the other one. And and yeah, um, Alistair, I think once you start playing around with things like ChatGPT, you'll find it's actually more engaging than what you think. There's this more to be excited about than, than worried about, I think. So give it a go. I think you might surprise yourself. Mm. Yeah, and, cool. and um, you can also find a lot of Nikki's um, work referenced on coachvici.com. So there are blogs and the blogs reference the research articles. So you can go and find the research papers through that too. Lots of great information on the site. Mumsy, can we come to you for a checkout? Thank you very much. And um. So appreciative of the opportunity to to listen to to Dr. Vicky because of it. It's like it's taking me from unconscious incompetence to an awareness level at least. Now I know that one could use or support the coaching practice using AI, especially for those administrative things of having to follow up and follow up and you know just to keep the person's momentum and interest hooked to coaching. And I'm very appreciative of that. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. pleasure. Great. Um, so so from my side, um, Nikki, you really opened up the, the possibilities for collaboration that I, I wasn't aware of. I, I must say, I was sitting with a yeah, maybe you can use AI a little bit as coaches, but I'm we have landed is quite excited actually about the collaboration opportunities and how it can really enhance coaching. And I love this idea of going to clients, to organizations and saying, here, here's the role for human coaches, here's the role for AI, and let's plug them together and let's create more impact and more access through that. So I'm I'm feeling quite amped actually. I'm very interested in the topic. I um I had my head in the sand a, a little bit about it earlier this year, and then I thought, you know what, there's something really exciting to embrace here, and so so that's where I've landed. Uh, Karen, it would be lovely to hear from you before we thank Nikki and and sign off. Okay, well I'll just be brief. Sorry, I just had to collect a delivery at the door. <clears throat> I just wanted to say to Nikki, thank you so much for opening our eyes and our minds, and to you too, Kate, for bringing it all together. It's really been fascinating. And I think the research that you've done is absolutely amazing coming from South Africa, from Cape Town, from Stellenbosch University. So unbelievable, um, high standard. And um, you've certainly opened up, I think, my eyes. And um, it is scary, but exciting at the same time. Um, I'm keen to read your research papers and may call on for some further information, but you've certainly piqued my curiosity. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Mm. Thank you so much. Mm. And Nikki, from all of us, like thank you so much for your time, but mostly for how you have offered this to us. A lot of in-depth rigor, uh, I can feel your integrity and in good intent behind the work, and also very relational. You've been very relational today, and thank you so much for, yeah, for for bringing that and being so approachable and open and to have this conversation with us. So thank you so much from our side. Absolutely welcome. Absolutely welcome. Yeah, and thank you everyone. It's wonderful to always hang out with coaches, but you're particularly nice and friendly and open. <laughs> and I also take a lot from this. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me. Mm, pleasure. And I did see somewhere in one of your blogs that you struggle to find coaches for your research. So I think do reach out to us. Um, well, you may well have, I see a couple of people nodding. I would be very happy to volunteer. So yeah. if you get to a piece where you need coaches for research, yeah. Please please connect with me on LinkedIn. I've posted, because I normally post a request for research on LinkedIn. So okay. if you connect with me there, then we'll do that. Thank you so much for the offer. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a lovely evening.
And thanks for Thank coming. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye.